It is now time for oral questions, and I recognize the Leader of Her Majesty's loyal opposition. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Speaker. Speaker, my first question is to the Premier. Home care in Ontario is so bad that it's making national headlines. We've seen, of course, in a story that uh, was recently published, provinces like Saskatchewan, like BC, like the territories provide fu publicly funded and publicly delivered home care to their residents, but not in Ontario. In Ontario, it's private companies that profit from care. Things were bad under the Liberal government, there's just no doubt about it. But it's become worse under this government, Speaker. As an investigation by CBC Marketplace found, that the result is that families who are expecting care to arrive for their loved one don't see that care come at all. They can wait and wait and wait, and nobody shows up because the PSW has been double booked by her company. My question is, Shouldn't why I? has the Premier allowed our broken home care system to get worse under his watch? Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the Leader of the Opposition for the question. Our government has heard firsthand about the difficulties Ontarians face accessing home care, and of course our Minister of Health was the patient ombudsman and heard many stories, which is why one of the top priorities when we entered government was to fix the broken system. And since then, we have been taking action to modernize home and community care with Ontario health teams posed to take on delivery over the coming years. And this makes home and community care part of our integrated health care offering and not a standalone service. Um, we know that people want to stay at home as long as possible, and that's why we, re we removed service maximums to allow them to have whatever hours they need to be able to stay at home. Um, but as the person in the marketplace um, uh, uh, video noted, Willie Foreman, some people cannot stay at home, so we also needed to repair long-term care, and we've been doing that with great investments in long-term care to make sure that those resources are available for people like her husband, Robert, who need to move into home care and long-term care. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Well, Speaker, uh, Natalie Mara from the Ontario Health Coalition said this about Ontario's for-profit uh, home care providers, and I quote, home care companies get contracts for visits uh, they do, that they do not fulfill yet they still get their money. One London family whose loved one had a very poor experience, very poor treatment from for-profit provider Extendicare said, and I quote, the care was so unreliable she was forced to put him in hospital where he waited months for a bed in a nursing home. The Auditor General said in a report in December, Speaker, and I quote, clients may not receive the level of care that they need when they need it. Now, this Premier should know that people, uh, families, loved ones want to stay in their homes as long as possible with the appropriate amount of care to help them stay there. So my question is, why is the Premier still supporting his profiteering home care buddies instead of starting to support uh, Ontarians who actually deserve the kind of quality and accessibility of home care that we could be able to give them? Thank you. The reply, Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the opposition leader for the question. Uh, when we came to power, there were over 30,000 people uh, on a wait list for long term care. These were people who were stuck in hospital and had nowhere to go, and like uh, Robert Foreman, uh, Willie's husband, needed the long term care support. By building long term care while investing in home care as well, we are ensuring that the entire continuum of care is in place for people who need it. The opposition res resorts to speculation and innuendo about privatization when no such thing is happening. We will continue to do the hard work of improving our public health care system across the board and finally solving our home care challenges that Ontarians frankly have been facing for many, many years under the former Liberal government for 15 years supported by the NDP. Exactly. The final supplementary. Well, uh, in fact, Speaker, the CBC investigation clearly showed that the for-profit providers don't do the work that they're paid to do, that they didn't do the work they were paid to do. In fact, one Ottawa family shared their tragic story, and I quote, much of the care that Bayshore promised was downloaded onto the family, and twice nurses didn't come for more than a week, including in the eight days prior to her husband's death. 
Sue Vanderbilt of Home Care Ontario, the CEO there, said, and I quote, we need help. We're in a crisis. That's what the home care providers are saying in our province. Home care is broken. Yes, it was broken under the Liberals, but it is broken under this Conservative government as well. So my question is, why won't this Premier commit question. to fixing home care and community care, just like his counterparts in and, and BC and Saskatchewan have been able to do uh, with a system that is publicly funded and delivered and actually meets the standard of quality of care that our residents in our province deserve. Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you again to the Leader of the Opposition. Our government is fixing home care. We're fixing the entire continuum of care in health care. We have to fix long-term care so that we can deal with hallway health care. Uh, we've been uh, addressing our hospital needs. We've started the largest recruitment for health human resources ever in Ontario's history. And recently, we invested an additional $548.5 million over three years in the home and community care sector. This will expand home care services, including supporting additional staff and personal support workers. The funding will uh, support up to an estimated 28,000 post-acute surgical patients and up to an estimated 21,000 patients with complex health conditions every year by providing 739,000 nursing visits, 157,000 nursing shift hours, 117,000 therapy visits, including physiotherapy, occupational therapy, speech-language pathology. 2,118,000 hours of personal support services and 236,000 hours of other home care visits. Good stuff. Thank you. The next question, once again, the Leader of the Opposition. Thank you so much, uh, Speaker. My next question is also for the Premier. I think we would all agree that long-term care saw the brunt uh, of the pandemic, the worst of the pandemic. The brunt was taken by the people who live in long-term care, the people who work in long-term care, the families of residents and workers in long-term care. Uh, and it was, it was a, a bad situation because there was a government that was unprepared and unwilling to invest the money necessary to protect those folks. The government's own commission found that a lack of infection and prevention controls existed, that there was no PPE provided, that there was not enough staff and not enough supports for the residents. Reluctantly, eventually, this government squeezed a little bit of money out and, and gave it to long-term care, but those funds, sadly, came with expiry dates. And so my question to this government, to this question. Premier, is why is the government cutting funds dedicated to or they're supposed to provide more staffing, retention uh, and, uh, and recruitment, as well as prevention, uh, inf infection prevention and control dollars in long-term care. Why is that being cut? Thank you. <laughs> Minister of Long-Term Care. Uh, Mr. Speaker, of course, uh, I, I don't even know where to begin with that question, yeah. uh, frankly, <laughs> Mr. Speaker, because there is no government in the history of this country that has ever made more investments in long-term care than this government. <laughs> Now, when, very directly to the Leader of the Opposition's questions on prevention and containment funding, we're actually increasing that by $328 million a year, Mr. Speaker. That is what this government has put in place. We're increasing staffing by over 27,000 uh, uh, health care workers. Uh, that's PSW, that's allied health care workers, that's, uh, uh, that's nurses, uh, Speaker. We're adding uh, 30,000 new long-term care beds. We're upgrading 28,000 additional beds, uh, Mr. Speaker, in the members' own Riding in the members' own riding. For, actually, forget the members' own riding. Let's do all of Hamilton combined, Mr. Speaker. We are increasing funding to homes in that area by seventy million dollars, so that we can get so that we can get to four hours of care, Mr. Speaker. I don't know where she has been, but this government is investing in long-term care for now and into the future, Mr. Speaker. A supplementary question. Well, Speaker, 4,398 residents in long-term care lost their lives to COVID-19, as did 10 staff, and that is something that we should never, ever forget. In a letter dated February 4th, this very minister uh, said that he recognizes there are staffing pressures, February 4th, staffing pressures in the system. That still exists. That's a reality. But his deputy wrote a letter uh, that, he, that says, and I quote, funding provided during the 21-22 fiscal year that is not spent by March 31st will be 
recovered by the government. That means that money has to be sent back. And that, my friends, is a cut. The funds that are going to be cut are for 24-7 screening of residents and staff, infection, infection prevention and control, staff recruitment and retention. I can have a page send this uh, letter over to the minister in case he didn't know uh, that the deputy sent it to uh, long-term care providers. So why is the Premier Question. cutting in long-term care when we should be providing more resources? Does he think that this staffing crisis is over? Mr. Long -term Care. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. This is, may come as a shock to people all over the province of Ontario, but at the end of a fiscal year, the government reconciles its books and works closely with organizations to find out what you spent, how you spent it, was it spent properly, was it spent for the things that we need it to be spent on. We work very closely with the sector. Now, had the Leader of the Opposition turn the page on that letter, she would have read that the government will be allocating an additional $328.7 million directly to long-term care homes to support their pre uh, prevention and containment, Mr. Speaker. That's on top of the $5 billion that we're spending on increasing staffing. That's on top of the $5 billion that is coming for new and upgraded homes, Mr. Speaker. That, of course, includes our increasing uh, uh, staffing by 27,000 additional staff, 30,000 additional beds, Mr. Speaker. Now, the unique thing about all of this is that on every occasion, that member voted against every single investment. Order. The final supplementary. Speaker, what this minister needs to reconcile is the fact that long-term care still remains in crisis under this government's watch with staffing problems, with infection prevention and control concerns, uh, and he is simply not paying attention to their serious concerns. They need to plan. They're being cut right now when in a couple of weeks the new fiscal starts and they have no idea what's happening. They need certainty to be able to hire more staff. They need those specialists in IPAC. Without proper staffing, we know what happens in long-term care. It's the residents that suffer. It's the residents that don't get the attention and quality of care that they deserve. Cutting money for staffing and infection prevention and control right now in long-term care is not going to fix our long-term care system. My question again Should is why will this Premier not acknowledge that long-term care is still broken? that we shouldn't be cutting any dollars from long-term care, stop those cuts and commit to fixing our long-term care system. Minister of Long-Term Care to respond. Mr. Speaker, the member ought to be ashamed of herself. Yeah. Ought to be ashamed of herself to suggest that we are cutting funding to long-term care when the member knows full well that that is absolutely not happening. It is an increase in funding for $328 million for prevention and containment alone. Now, the member doesn't seem to know the difference between IPAC funding, which is infection prevention and control, and prevention and containment. So the IPAC funding has also increased by hundreds of millions of dollars. Prevention and containment has increased by hundreds of millions of dollars. We're adding new staffing, Mr. Speaker, in her own riding. $2 million last year, over $2.5 million last year, $6 million 22-23, $15 million by 24-25 to get us to four hours of care. I just announced last week an additional $672 million to increase staffing across the province, and we've also committed to $1.2 billion the year after and $1.8 billion the year after, Mr. Speaker. That is investments to make our long-term care system the best in this country. No thanks to that member. Next question, the member for University Rosedale. Speaker, my question is to the Premier. Public dollars spent on public transit should benefit the public interest, Ontario's public interest. So why is a Russian oligarch, under sanction following the invasion of Ukraine, poised to benefit from a $750 million contract for the Scarborough subway extension? To reply, the Minister of Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Infrastructure Ontario Metrolinks require all companies working with them to abide by sanctions that are imposed by the Government of Canada. Since those sanctions have been in place, Infrastructure Ontario is conducting due diligence and reviewing all contractors, all teams, and all teams uh, that intend on bidding on future projects. 
Mr. Speaker, Strabag has communicated publicly that they are severing all relations with that particular individual. The supplementary question. My question is back to the Premier. Earlier this month, we learned that this government secretly reduced the Canadian content requirements for subway vehicle contracts from 25 per cent to 10 per cent. And this comes at a time when Ontario workers in the Alston plant in Thunder Bay face layoffs lasting up to a year as they wait for more transit vehicle contracts. So meanwhile, 27.8 per cent of the company that won a $750 million subway contract is owned by a sanctioned Russian oligarch. So let me get this correct. Why does this government's subway contracts have nearly 28 per cent Russian oligarch content, but only 10 per cent Ontario worker content? Wow. The Associate Minister of Transportation, responsibility for the GTA. Thank you, Speaker. So I, I thought we made this issue very clear a month ago when the Leader of the Opposition asked about the Canadian content policy, which I will clarify once again for the Opposition, has not changed and remains at 25 per cent. But no matter how much the Opposition calls for 25 per cent Canadian content, we will not reduce it in the construction of the Ontario Line from 75 per cent Canadian content, 90 per cent of which will be made right here in Ontario, Speaker. Now, here's the ironic part of the questions from the members opposite, Speaker. They talk about protecting Canadian jobs, but they stood here for the better part of two decades supporting the Liberals when they didn't build transit, when they didn't bring those jobs to Canada, and when it came to the most historic transit investment in Canadian history at $28.5 billion. What did the opposition say, Speaker? No. They voted against that. They voted against the Ontario line, $11 billion back to the local economy, and against 5,000 Canadian jobs. Speaker, we will not take lessons from the NDP on creating Canadian jobs in this province. Next question, the member for Don Valley North. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Long-Term Care. Speaker, long-term care as a sector has, been, has long been neglected by successful governments. Between 2011 and 2018, the previous Liberal governments only managed to build 611 net new beds. That is an increase of only 0.8 per cent, while the population of Ontarians aged 75 and over grew by 20 per cent. Speaker, that is 611 beds for over 176,000 people. Speaker, this is simply unacceptable. Ontarians deserve to know their government is hard at work to deliver the quality long-term care Question. spaces seniors can count on. So through you, Speaker, can the Minister please tell the House what recent investments have been made to fix long-term care in Ontario? Thank you. Mr. Long -term care. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and, uh, and I applaud the, the member for Don Valley uh, North on, the, on that question and his advocacy for his, uh, for his community. For his community. Uh, uh, also, the, uh, the, uh, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health uh, uh, for her advocacy that saw us, saw us have the opportunity to announce additional beds for Villa Colombo, a, a new upgrade there, uh, Mr. Speaker, and as well the member for Scarborough Agent Court. Uh, uh, who joined uh, me when we announced some additional funding for uh, homes in Toronto. Look, it's uh, over 1,600 new beds is what we announced uh, just last week uh, 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 across uh, Toronto. It's part of our, our plan to build 30,000 uh, new beds, upgrade 28,000. The member is absolutely correct. The fact that over the previous 15 years, so few uh, investments were made in long-term care, and in many of those occasions, obviously supported by the NDP, who held the balance of power in that time, Mr. Speaker. We knew that we couldn't allow that to happen. We knew that we had to do Response. better for our seniors. We knew that we had to do better for the people who helped make this the best province in the world in which to live, work, invest, and to raise a family. And that is why we are doing so much, investing so much. And again, thank you to all of the members on this side of the House who advocate every single day for these investments. Here. A supplementary question. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And thank you to the Minister for that response. I am proud to be part of the government. That is uh, finally fixing long-term care. But, Speaker, we all know that beds alone are not enough to ensure 
Thus, our seniors receive the proper hands-on care that they deserve. Governments of all stripes have heard of the need for four hours of daily directed care for residents in long-term care. But from 2009 to 2018, the previous Liberal government only increased directed care to residents by 21 minutes. That is a 12% increase over nine years, or slightly more than 10 minutes per year. Question. Speaker, our government facing long-term care act enshrined our commitment to providing an average for our four hours of directed care per resident per day. Speaker, can the minister tell the House on what the government is doing to fulfill this commitment? Thank you. Mr. Long-Term Care. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And, and again, thank the member for that question. He has been working so very hard, and I certainly have all the scars to prove of how hard he has been working uh, for his community, not only in terms of building, getting new bed allocations for his uh, community, but as the member has said to me on many occasions, there is no point in building new buildings if you don't have the people to work within those buildings, uh, 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 Speaker. And he is one of the key architects, of course, and I, and I thank him for this, of getting us to that commitment where we will make four hours of care and shrine it in, uh, uh, in, uh, in the new Fixing Long-Term Care Act, uh, uh, something that no other government has been able to, able to do. Now, for his community alone, uh, that means an additional uh, $4.7 million on the announcement that I made Tuesday. So in case the House missed it, on Tuesday I announced $673 million uh, for additional staffing. That's an additional 10,000 people within the sector because of this funding. For the members riding, that means over $4.7 million. And again, I thank the member for his, uh, his hard work in getting us to this, uh, uh, this great announcement and to helping us get into a position where we can fix long-term care for generations to come. Next question. Member for Thunder Bay, Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. On Thursday, the Premier went to the Alston plant in my riding during the evening shift. It's too bad the Premier didn't face over the 1,000 families affected by avoidable layoffs or the small businesses and their employees who supply the plant that also now face an uncertain future. Many of the workers the Premier met will be laid off next week. During this government's time in office, the number of workers at that plant has gone down from 1,200 workers headed to 75 workers this summer. The plant needs large, long-term orders from the province to keep workers' jobs. Premier, why won't this government do more for the workers at the Alston plant? Number five, the Minister of Northern Development. I've had the opportunity to, to visit the Alston plant with the Premier no less than three times over the past couple of years, and there's no question, Mr. Speaker, but what they do know is that this government stands shoulder to shoulder with them on one of the largest transit expansions in the history of this province and likely this country over, Mr. Speaker. It's this government, unlike the federal government, who committed $1 billion worth of train cars to a plant in Los Angeles that has stood there with brand new trains and refurbishments of uh, uh, existing ones, Mr. Speaker, no less than $350 million uh, announced by my colleague, the Minister of Transport, to ensure uh, that the Alston plan in Thunder Bay has the orders that it needs, Mr. Speaker. And during this difficult time of conversion, Mr. Speaker, that plant will come back stronger than ever yeah. later this summer and start to build Ontario's transit out. And we're proud of that, Mr. Speaker, and we appreciate job, those man. workers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The supplementary question. My question is for the Premier. The only new cars being built at the Alston plant are an American order. This government has announced an order of 60 streetcars and refurbishing 91 bi-level cars for the Elston plant. But it has, that plant has the capacity to do so much more. For example, the vehicles for the Ontario line should be made in Thunder Bay. Yet this government has lowered Ontario's mass transit vehicle content requirement rules to just 10% from the 25%. The plant needs large, long-term orders to create more jobs. That's what we hear from the plant. That's what we hear from the workers. Small orders and, re and refurbishments aren't the answer. 
Premier, why won't this government reverse itself, increase the Canadian content for the Ontario Line subway trains so they could be made at the Alston plant in Thunder Bay? Minister? Thank, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I want to welcome the member finally to this discussion, exactly. Mr. Speaker, after a couple of years of hard work on the ground in Thunder Bay. You know, Mr. Speaker, they are working on a, a, a couple of American orders right now because they finished a couple of orders from Ontario, and as soon as they convert over the course of this spring and summer, Mr. Speaker, they're going to be working on a whole bunch of other train cars here, to, the spe to the tune, Mr. Speaker, of $350 million. And they know, Mr. Speaker, from our visit last week that we're committed to a 75% Canadian plan, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that Ontario workers and Canadian workers are involved in this, Mr. Speaker. Sadly, Mr. Speaker. The only thing that concerns me about this is that when it comes to earmarking $354 million for train cars, how did that member vote, oh, Mr. Speaker? No. We oh, told the, the, the workers at all last week, by the way. Oh, she voted against it, Mr. No. Speaker. Oh, so did her oh, time. Oh, Shame on them, Mr. Speaker. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Thank you very much, Speaker. My question is for the Premier. This morning, debate began on Bill 88. And we know that the bill got off to a bad start when the government tried to sneak through eliminating the traditional College of Chinese Medicine simply because somebody whispered in the Premier's ear. And it's clear now that they haven't consulted on the rest of this bill. There's way more sizzle than there is any stake in this bill. The Premier would be hard-pressed to convince anyone that the Working for Workers Act actually works for workers. Instead of bringing gig workers under the Employment Standards Act, it actually creates a second class of workers in Ontario who don't get things like vacation pay or other rights and protections that Ontario workers have earned and deserve. So, Speaker 3, will the government withdraw Bill 88 and take the time to get it right Question. to make sure we actually protect gig workers in this province? To respond, the member for Mississauga Malton and Parliamentary Assistant. <clears throat> Through you, Mr. Speaker, I want to say thank you to the member opposite uh, for that question and thank you for listening about the important work this government is doing on Bill 88. So thank you for that. Mr. Speaker, our government uh, that has been and continues to work for the worker. This includes those who work on the digital platform in the gig economy. The gig economy is here to stay and the number of gig workers is expected to rise. That is why our government is advocating for the foundational rights for these workers. Our proposed legislature would make Ontario the first province to give digital workers these rights. Your uh, legislation will ensure that gig workers had paid minimum wage, they are not dismissed without notice, explanation or recourse, and they are able to resolve their workplace disputes right here in Ontario. Mr. Response. Speaker, our government is going to work every single day to work for our workers, and we want to make sure that they know that we have their backs. We are continuously striving to better protect our workers on this side of the aisle. Thank you. Thank you. The supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. It is clear their intent on creating a second class of workers here in Ontario. Maybe it's because someone else whispered in the premier, Premier's ear. I don't know. So workers who don't get health and safety coverage. So the Premier's message to gig workers is, if you get hurt at work, you're on your own. Right? Workers who don't get pay, vacation pay or stat holidays. Workers who don't get the right to organize or bargain. Workers who only get paid for engaged time, minimum wage for engaged time. That's like saying to the cashier in the supermarket, I'm only going to pay you when someone's at your cash register. It's crazy. Speak, speaker, the Working for Workers Act is legislating gig workers as second-class workers in Ontario, saying they don't deserve the right, same rights as all Ontario, other Ontario workers. So, Speaker, through you, will the Premier Question. commit to broad public consultations and amend Bill 88 so it actually gives gig workers the rights and protections they deserve. Member for Mississauga Mall. Thank you again. Through you, Mr. Speaker, I will say again, this is the government who is working for the workers. That is why uh, 
we were the first one in North America to bring these kind of bills. Mr. Speaker, workers in the gig economy often face uncertain conditions and lack protection, including difficult predicting paychecks. One week it is $1,000, the other week it is $500. That is why Working for Workers Act 2 will include the right for these workers to keep their full tips in addition to these regular pay periods. That is why it will include the right for information and clarity around the algorithms used by these platforms, how pay is calculated, why a worker might be penalized the allocation of work. They will know this information. We are providing these workers with much needed transparency in their pay. We are providing them the right they deserve. So, Mr. Speaker, we want an economy that works for everyone. We want all workers to have the opportunity to earn Response. a good living and provide their families. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Next question, member for Peterborough, Kawartha. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. The pandemic has severely impacted nearly all of Ontario's sectors, and one of the hardest hit was the sports sector. Based on advice from our public health experts, the risk was too high to safely play organized sports. Ontario's athletes and sports clubs are now eagerly returning to do what they love most, and that's play sport. However, all the time away from the game has impacted the sector immensely. Speaker, can the minister tell us what the government is doing to ensure the economic stability of Ontario's sports sector? Mr. Heritage, Sports, Tourism and Culture Industry. community uh, sport and recreation in Peterborough. Um, let me mention just three, uh, three areas where he has brought to, uh, to me and to our government the attention of the plight of the Peterborough Peets. Uh, he's been working day in and day out. Uh, the, can the Canadian Canoe Museum, which he made a significant investment on this past year, as well as the challengers, uh, the young fellas and girls that are out there each and every day with their special abilities, making sure they're playing the game, which is why our government has made an unprecedented commitment of over $110 million of new money Thanks to our finance minister working with me uh, so we could ensure that organizations are up and running and they are supporting the sector. That includes $20 million just past week, a couple weeks ago, to provincial sport organizations and multi-sport organizations. $7 million to the Ontario Sport Network, including female uh, athletes. $3 million to assist the Ontario Hockey League. $250,000 to support Ontario Summer Indigenous Games. $50 million into the Ontario Trillium Foundation's uh, Community Building Fund and $9.7 million in emergency relief. We care about sports and recreation on this side of the House, Speaker. Thank you. <laughs> this supplementary question. Thank you, Speaker. I've often said that everything you need to learn, everything you need to, to know to survive socially in the world, you can learn through team sports. I'm a big fan of everything that you get when you're working together as a team. And I want to thank the minister for her response. It seems our government truly understands the importance of sport. Every year we see more and more women and girls taking part in sports. However, they're still underrepresented, underrepresented in a majority of the major sports played in this province. Speaker, can the minister please explain what's being done to ensure women in the sports sector receive the support they deserve from this government? Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries. It's a very important uh, question. As a, as a former elite athlete myself when I was much younger, as a hockey mother and, and, a, and a former hockey coach, I think it's really important that we continue to invest into female sports, which is why our government has made unprecedented commitments to support our female athletes. Uh, more than $3.5 million this past year went to support our female athletes in the 2021 Quest for Gold program, with over 52 per cent of that money going toward our female athletes who represented us at both Olympics. Uh, we've supported over 980,000 women uh, through $62.3 million to our provincial sport organizations. And for the first time in the history of this province, this government, under this ministry, is investing in female sports, including cheerleading, dance, and skipping rope, which was never done before. But we made a commitment to that because we recognized throughout the pandemic those sports were not able to be supported. In addition, Response? we were able to support with over an additional $80,000 to the Ontario University Athletics Association, which we hope will make sure that there's parity for women in sport with the funding that we've provided them. The next question, the member for Keewatinong. Speaker, uh, my question is to the Premier. Uh, Southern Ontario uh, is putting the pandemic behind them. 
But for those of us who live in the far north, the pandemic is not over. Janet Gordon of the Sulukot First Nations Health Authority uh, said last week that flying First Nations and local public health officials should have been consulted before lifting public health measures. I know one of the things that she said was, Ontario gets treated the same, but our situation is different. Why were Northern public health officials not consulted before the decision was made to lift the majority of public health protections this week? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you to the member opposite for the question. Our government recognizes that culturally appropriate care is essential in supporting improved health, health outcomes for Indigenous people in Ontario, and we remain committed to working collaboratively with our Indigenous partners and communities, working on programs that will improve access to safe and effective health care services. Uh, our government has been working with the federal government and with local health care partners to support the coordination efforts of Sioux Lookout First Nations Health Authority, which has been facilitating response efforts. In addition to surge capacity report supports, the province has assisted uh, in providing a request for assistance to the Canadian Armed Forces for the provision of Canadian Ranger supports on the ground and in the community. We will continue to work successfully with our First Nations partners uh, as we have uh, through Operation uh, Remote Community 1, 2 and 3 to ensure that they have the resources that they need. The supplementary question. Speaker, uh, the only thing I heard is uh, our First Nations. And, uh, you don't own us. You don't own First Nations. <laughs> uh, Speaker, uh, Deer Lake First Nation is in a major COVID outbreak. The, num the number of cases is now 275. Their population is 1,200 people. 20 275 is 23% uh, of their uh, population. And I know, uh, speaking to them this morning, their workforce is right now very low. Community members who have stepped up uh, you know, to support the households uh, that are in isolation. So that's the support that they have. Speaker, again, uh, Northern Public Health officials wrote this government last week and asked for resourcing for medical assistance teams to support Northern First Nations like Deer Lake that are in crisis. Question. How will you support this request? Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Throughout the COVID-19 pandemic, our government has taken action to support First Nations and other remote communities in Ontario. To be clear, we know that First Nations communities are facing challenges, and that's why we have taken swift action to ensure these communities have been identified as a priority group. Additionally, we've invested $37 million in supporting Indigenous services during COVID-19, and that includes $16.4 million to help with the distribution of goods, transportation support for urban Indigenous people, self-isolation, prevention awareness, and pandemic planning, $10 million to ensure continuity of services offered by Indigenous social services agencies to vulnerable children, youth, adults, families during the outbreak, $4 million to ensure continuity of services at remote and northern airports serving Indigenous communities, $7.4 million to help social service providers, charities and not-for-profits delivering critical housing services to Indigenous people living off-reserve. With the leadership of our Premier and our Minister of Indigenous Affairs, we will continue to support the First Nations communities in Ontario. Thank you. The next question, the member for Don Valley West. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is for the Premier. Um, speaker, by 2018, Ontario was well on its way to being a strong leader in electric vehicle manufacturing and research. In 2015, our government was investing in electric charging uh, stations. By 2017, our Jobs and Prosperity Fund has had invested in Johnson Electric to the tune of $24 million to support a $350 million investment to drive electric auto manufacturing. In March of 2017, I made a joint announcement with Prime Minister Trudeau of federal and provincial investment to create 300 new clean tech, high, clean tech jobs in partnership with Ford Canada. And in February 2016, a full six years ago, Mr. Speaker, I announced and we implemented a new electric vehicle incentive program to help Ontarians to purchase low or zero emissions vehicles. In 2018, this government, led by this Premier, attempted to bring all of that Question. to a halt. He did his best to kill the electric vehicle market. Happily, leaders in the automotive sector knew that we were on the right track, and they kept 
continuing to develop their industry. Now that the current government has had an epiphany, Mr. Speaker, on electric vehicles, will they reverse their wrong-headed decision and restore electric vehicle incentives? And to reply, the government house leader. Uh, speaker, I, I think that question in itself highlights why it is that the people of the province of Ontario lost faith in the previous Liberal government. So let's get it straight. What the Liberals are asking us to do is to give a certain small sector of people money so that they can afford to buy electric vehicles. And we said no. Instead, what we're going to do is put the policies in place that will allow us to build millions of electric vehicles with thousands of people working in the sector. So that get this, Mr. Speaker. So that get this, Mr. Speaker. It's not only a small subsect of people who can afford to buy the most expensive electric vehicles. It's all Ontarians who can afford to buy those vehicles, Mr. Speaker. And that there is the difference between a Conservative government and a Liberal government. They want to help a small group of people. What we said is no, we Response. can do more. We can be the centre of innovation. We can be the centre of electric vehicle manufacturing in the province through the hard work of the Minister of Economic Development, through the hard work of the Minister of, of uh, Mines and Northern Development. We're well on our way, Mr. Speaker, and of course, the Minister of Energy. Thank you. And the supplementary question. Mr. Speaker, actually what I was saying was that that progress was already underway in 2018. This government stopped that progress. Order. And come inside, come to order. And the, the opening of the electric vehicle market, Mr. Speaker, was for all of Ontario. It was not for a particular group of people, Mr. Speaker. It was for families to have vans to be able to order. take their kids to school and to, to soccer games, Mr. Speaker. It was about everybody having access, having roughed in electric chargers in their, in their garages, Mr. Speaker. But this government cancelled its changes to the building code. Mr. Speaker, I get the politics in 2018 when this government came in and cut uh, education, cut health care, cut environmental programs, Mr. Speaker. I get the politics of that. But, Mr. Speaker, now they've had their epiphany. Now they understand that the industry has been leading to vehicles. Will they bring back, will they institute rebates, Mr. Speaker, so that everyone in Ontario can have the opportunity to purchase an electric vehicle? Stop the clock. Okay. I could hear the member for Don Valley West place her question, notwithstanding the cacophony that was going on over here. If it continues, I will start calling you out by name. Can you start the clock? The response? Government House Leader. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I, I don't even, again, I don't know where to go with this, Mr. Speaker. So under the previous Liberal watch, the president of Chrysler said that Ontario is the least favourable jurisdiction in which to invest, and if the policies didn't change, Chrysler would have left the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. We saw GM close because of the policies of that premier, Mr. Speaker. We saw high energy Order. prices. And now, all of a sudden, the average family is going to take their $150,000 Tesla and put the kids in the back <laughs> and go to soccer, Mr. Speaker. Order. And that is the difference in a nutshell, Mr. Speaker. In a nutshell, Mr. Speaker, what we said is let's put the environment in play. Stop the clock. We'll, we'll start with the Minister of Energy come to order. The member for Don Valley West will come to order. The member for York Centre will come to order. You still got a few seconds, sir. Please restart the clock. Will the government house leader conclude his response? Again, Mr. Speaker, look, we put in place the incentives that uh, will help the economy grow. The Minister of Energy has brought stability to the uh, hydroelectricity sector in this province. The Minister of Economic Development, Job Creation and Trade has removed, has removed red tape and barriers to investment response? in the province of Ontario. We're investing in health care so people can come back into this province. And the result is that Ontario is the centre of economic development, job creation and trade because of the policies of this government. Not the next question, the member for Brantford Brant. Thank you, Speaker. My question is for the Minister of Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Mr. Speaker, by now it's obvious that much of the world is supporting innovative technologies and moving towards a green economy, yeah. which will ultimately lead to the eventual replacement of fossil fuels. And while it's true that some jurisdictions are farther along the road than others, we can cl see clearly that there is always progress to be made, both abroad and here at home. As the Green Wave approaches, Speaker, what is the minister and our government doing to prepare our province for the next revolution in the green economy? All right. Northern Development, Mines, Natural Resources and Forestry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I want to thank the member from Brantford and Brant for his question and uh, the fact that he knows his constituents, the folks from Six Nations of the Grand River, uh, as they embark on a large-scale battery storage project, need critical minerals for that kind of technology uh, to work, not just for their community, that corridor, and for the, uh, for the province of Ontario, Mr. Speaker. In the context of global strife, we know that, unfortunately, countries like Russia and China have a stranglehold on critical minerals. But here's the good news, Mr. Speaker. Last week, the Premier and I rolled out our critical mineral strategy, a well-funded strategy, Mr. Speaker, to ensure that from the prospecting to extraction to uh, processing and integration into new technologies, Mr. Speaker, like electric vehicle, like electric batteries, like technology, and like Response? national defence, Mr. Speaker, we intend to take our rightful place as a leader in supplying critical minerals. Supplementary question. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, Minister, for that answer. I think we can all agree that the critical mineral strategy represents a major turning point, not just for our province's mining workers, but for our Indigenous communities, like my community with the Six Nations of the Grand River. Indeed, I am equally sure that the hardworking men and women within the sector appreciate the support and affirmation of our government. For too long, the previous government put the mining industry on the back burner. It did not support it in order for it to reach its full potential. I wonder, however, through you, Speaker, could the minister tell us more about the government's strategy, the opportunity that we have in front of us, and how this strategy will put Ontario in a good place to create integrated supply chains, particularly as they apply to advanced manufacturing? Thank you. Mr. Northern Development. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I can't think of a time, certainly in the two chapters of my political career, where there's been a complete alignment, Mr. Speaker, of the opportunities in Northern Ontario and the opportunities in Southern Ontario, that in their aggregate, Mr. Speaker, ensure that Northern Ontario will play a critical role, no pun intended, in the prospecting and the extraction and the processing side, Mr. Speaker. It's why we invested $5 million in cobalt processing, the first of its kind in North America. Mr. Speaker. It's why we invested in Frontier lith Lithium last week as part of our uh, critical mineral strategy. Mr. Speaker. It's why we're pouring $25 million into uh, exploration activities sure. in the North to ensure that we've properly identified uh, our critical mineral supply. Mr. Speaker. We know it's world-class. It's an exquisite supply, uh, quantity and quality. Mr. Spons? Speaker. We just need to get it to market, and we just need the support of people all across North, which we have, Mr. Speaker, and we're moving forward with that strategy. We're proud of it. Next question, the member for Brampton Centre. Thank you, Speaker. Uh, my question is for the Minister of Health or the Premier. Uh, Speaker, the people of Brampton continue to be neglected by the government when it comes to our health care system. It's no secret that we've never received our fair share of provincial health care investments. For decades, people living in Brampton have been forced to leave our community to access life saving cancer care. I hear from constituents on a regular basis that they have to leave our community to visit cities like Mississauga, Toronto, and others in order to access life-saving radiation or chemotherapy treatments at Trillium Health Partners, Princess Margaret Hospital, or Sunnybrook Health Sciences. Speaker, provincial projections show that in the next 20 years, the number of cancer cases in William Osler's catchment area is expected to double, and within the next 10 years, the need for radiation therapy is expected to increase by more than 60 per cent. Speaker, when will this government Question. make the necessary investments to provide life-saving radiation treatment for the residents of Brampton? Member for Eglinton Lawrence and Parliamentary Assistant. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Our government has been focused on ensuring Ontarians have access to the care that they need when they need it. And Ontario Health, uh, Cancer Care Ontario, is the government's advisor on cancer and renal systems and flows more than $2 billion to hospitals uh, to support direct patient care every year. 
Ontario Health Cancer Care Ontario's oversees Ontario's overall cancer strategy, including critical programs. Uh, which really support patients and serve with services such as cancer surgery, chemotherapy, radiation therapy, Ontario's cancer screening programs such as Ontario breast cancer screening, colon cancer check, uh, Ontario cervical screening programs, Ontario lung screening programs, and the Ontario renal network is also a part of that, which manages dialysis services for the province, and they are constantly tracking performance to ensure improvements Response? in cancer care and chronic kidney disease and access to care. This includes for patients in Brampton. I'll have more to say about that in the supplemental. The supplementary question. Speaker, well, I urge uh, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Health to read the 2018 Cancer Care Ontario's report, which indicated that radiation treatment uh, capital investment strategy, they in that uh, strategy emphasized the need for greater radiation uh, treatment capacity in the Central West area, listing Brampton as a preferred site. But to date, Speaker, Brampton has not received its fair share, and we continue to receive the lowest per capita health care funding for all of our health care services. With decades of obvious neglect, advocates have even accused the Ford government of violating the Canada Health Care Act by not providing adequate funding to meet basic health care needs in our city. Speaker, the people of Brampton are tired of waiting in hallways. We are tired of driving our loved ones to other cities to access health care, and the people of this community deserve better. Speaker, when will this government provide the support so Brampton can receive the cancer care that it deserves and invest? in our comprehensive cancer care plan. Member for Eglinton Lawrence. Thank you, Speaker, and thank you again to the member opposite for the question. Uh, we have uh, read the 2018 report. It was a, it was a comment on the sad and sorry state uh, that we found the system when we came to government after 15 years of uh, the Wynne Del Duca government um, supported by the NDP 100 percent of the time. Ontario um, Health, Cancer Care Ontario, launched Ontario's cancer care plan 2019 to 2023, a strategic guide for improving the cancer system in Ontario, and that is what our government is doing, thanks to the great advocacy work done by the member for Brampton South and the member for Brampton West. Uh, we are making sure we make the investments necessary in Brampton for the first time ever. I think the mayor of Brampton in the fall called it a huge step in the right direction, investments in Brampton. For 15 years, the Liberals, propped up by the NDP, heard the calls for better care in Brampton and did nothing. But this government is acting to make sure the people of Brampton get the care that they deserve. The next question, the member for York Centre. Question, question to the Minister of Health. Order. The questions to the Minister of Health. For two years, this government justified the catastrophe it imposed on Ontarians by citing data and experts. Two years of missed cancer screenings, depression, overdose, loss of hope, and egregious charter violations. But now we learn that the data wasn't reliable. The burden of COVID on our hospitals was roughly half of what the minister told us. The deaths are 20 to 40 percent lower. But nothing compares to her use of the modeling by the science table. Time and time again, I stood up in this house to point out basic flaws in the table's modeling. But when last week the science table warned about the government's reopening plans, the minister dismissed the table as being overly pessimistic in its previous estimates. Well, hallelujah. With an election two months away, the minister is dismissing the alarmist modeling practices of the science table. My question is, why did it take two years for the minister to call out the question. science fiction tendered by the science table? To reply, the government house leader. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, uh, look, uh, what happens is this, is that the science table provides projections. Uh, we work with the Chief Medical Officer of Health to assess what that would mean, and then the government makes recommendations so that we don't hit the high projections. So it is actually good news when fewer people are infected. It's actually good news when we do better than what the science table says, Mr. Speaker. So that's, I would say, good news for the people of the province of Ontario. I've said it right from the beginning, Mr. Speaker. We are doing everything that we can to get Ontario out of the pandemic. But it's not just about that, Mr. Speaker. It is about ensuring that we have a strong economy post-pandemic, and that's where we're at, Mr. Speaker. Now, look, I know the honourable gentleman is busy. He's running for the leadership of the Federal Conservative Party, so I was, I was, I'm actually surprised to see him in this house today. But as a presumptive national leader. One would assume that he wants Ontario to be Response. the economic engine of confederation, and that's what we're making sure that we have, Mr. Speaker. 
in the supplementary policy. Speaker, the science table was wrong time and time again. And it's not about the trajectory of cases. The government House Leader doesn't understand. It's, because, it's not because of altered behavior, but because it never got the key metrics correctly. The factor of mortality or of hospitalization was never wrong. It was always overestimated. Even the most COVID-devout individuals who work in this building started to clue in as early as a year ago that it might as well be called a science fiction table. It's time for review and accountability. Will the government House Leader commit to requesting and assembling all models, graphs, data, memoranda, correspondence and records relating to the modeling that inform the table's periodic modeling, and will he make it available to the public for peer review? And if he won't release it, then what went into the modeling, and what is he hiding? Order. Government House Leader to respond. I guess uh, science fiction would be any hope that I might be a senator under the leadership of, uh, of the member opposite, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, look, uh, Speaker, uh, there is a reason why Ontario did better than any other jurisdiction in the world. It's because we listened and we acted, Mr. Speaker. That is something that a responsible government does, Mr. Speaker. Now, this gentleman got up in his place every single vote, time after time after time after time, and voted in favour of the very same measures that we brought in place that he now says that he didn't believe in. So I would say to the honourable gentleman, if you want to be a national leader like you are, you have to have a plan, and that Order. plan has to be something that people can rely upon. You don't want to be like the people that you sit behind, flipping and flopping all over the place, Mr. Speaker. That is not good for Canada. It's not good for Ontario. Response. But I tell you what, Mr. Speaker, we're going to keep moving forward so that we can make Ontario continue to make Ontario the best place to live, work, invest, yeah. and to raise a family. And that is something we'll. Okay. The next question, the member for Davenport. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, good morning. My question is for the Premier. Speaker, Radio Canada is reporting that the government directed drafters of the new science curriculum to remove examples of climate change action. In fact, the science curriculum doesn't even mention the words climate change until kids hit grade five. Speaker, this government may want to deny it, but the science is absolutely clear. The crisis is now action is essential, and it's indeed the greatest threat to our planet, our health, and yet to the reality that those children are going to be living with. It's time this government came clean. Mr. Speaker, why did the government direct climate action to be removed from the curriculum, and will they reverse this terrible decision? The member for Flamborough, or rather um, Niagara West and Parliamentary. Thank you very much, uh, Speaker, and I am very uh, proud to be able to stand on behalf of the government and speak to the important work that the government has undertaken to address uh, the importance of addressing climate change. We've been building in resiliency funding. We've been ensuring that each and every uh, community in our province is learning more about the ways we can work together to fight, fight climate change, and we've seen leadership from many ministries working together to ensure uh, that our students are also learning about and knowing more about the ways that we can work together as a province to ensure that we're reducing littering, that we're fighting climate change through also reducing carbon emissions by making sure that we have strong and resilient communities and those are the actions that our government has taken but speaker when it comes to the science curriculum a very very important curriculum that I know the people of Ontario have spent a great deal of time working to ensure that uh, they brought forward their ideas that we heard from experts to make sure that we have a curriculum that prepares students for the jobs of today and tomorrow Response. that ensures that they are prepared to take up whether it's uh, jobs in the skilled trades whether it's jobs in, in steam whether it's jobs in, in uh, technology, we are taking every action to make sure each and every province student in the province of Ontario is prepared for the job. Mr. Speaker, the parliamentary assistant to the Minister of Education just stood there and did not deny that they took climate action out of their order. curriculum. That is order. outrageous. It's government side, come to order. Unbelievable. Speaker, while this government has decided. Hey. Okay. Minister of Heritage, Sport, Tourism and Culture Industries come to order. Mr. Municipal Affairs come to order. Member for Davenport had the floor. Please restart the clock. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. They don't like being called out for this because we found out now that they are putting ideology ahead of science in our children's curriculum, and it's outrageous. Order. Mr. Speaker, 
There are more and more alarm bells. Stop the clock. Member for Renfrew Nipissing Pembroke to come to order. It's good to hear from you again. <laughs> Minister of Energy, come to order. I'm determined that the member for Davenport will be able to place her question without interruption, without further interruption. Please restart the clock. Member for Davenport. Yes, I'm getting under their skin. Uh, Mr. Speaker, first of all, outrageous. Secondly, there are more alarm bells ringing today uh, about this government's cuts and their impact on our education system. A new survey of Ontario principles by People for Education was released today, and it is a damning indictment of this government's failure to support our schools, our students, our school staff. 90% of principals, Mr. Question. Speaker, said staffing shortages were their top concern. Speaker, this government's lack of support has pushed our schools and the people who work in them to the breaking point. Only 43% said their schools had the resources necessary to support the mental health and well-being of our students. That is shameful. When will the Premier get real about recovery and reverse his planned cuts to education? My thanks to the member opposite for the question today, and it gives me the opportunity to stand in the Legislature and speak about the important investments that Premier Ford and Minister Lecce and the entire go Government of Ontario have brought forward to the education sector. And I want to also just acknowledge the incredible dedication and hard work of so many frontline staff, principals, teachers, educational assistants across this province Davenport over the two on. years. We do know that, of course, uh, the pandemic had a major impact on the delivery of education here in the province, and that's why our government has committed billions of dollars to ensure that we have additional staffing supports, that we have additional HEPA filters, thousands, tens of thousands of HEPA filters added to every school in this province. Investments in personal protective equipment, Speaker, ensuring that we have the supports that are necessary to support our students, including $25 million for professional assessments, a tripling, a, a quadrupling, actually, of the mental health supports in place to ensure that our students are supported, substantial investments, historic investments that are going to make sure that each and every classroom in the province of Ontario is a supportive environment for our students. Thank you very much. The next question, the member for Ottawa South. Uh, my question is for the Solicitor General, and I know that the Solicitor General is going to be introducing legislation later this afternoon, but there's still the issue of this, the occupation of the city of Ottawa for almost three weeks um, into February. And as the minister would know, the cost for the city of Ottawa for policing alone is $36.3 million. $36.3 million. That's on top of the kind of suffering that the people of downtown Ottawa had to live through. Now, I understand this legislation is supposed to address those occupations at Windsor and Ottawa, but I think the first order of business is to actually share those costs with the City of Ottawa and the federal government as well, too. Now, last week when I was speaking to the minister, I know that they've changed the police services board in Ottawa, not at the crest of the City of Ottawa, the government decided to take their police services board members off. There's a meeting this week. They haven't appointed anybody. So I have two questions. Two. Number one, will the government commit to sharing policing costs for the occupation of Ottawa, the city of Ottawa? And will the government commit to making sure that their appointees, their political appointees to the Ottawa Police Services Board will come before the government agencies committee before they're appointed Thank you. Thank you. And Minister of Municipal Affairs and Housing. Speaker, I, I want to thank the uh, honourable member for the uh, questions, uh, and I want to take this opportunity to uh, to thank all of our uh, members of the Legislative Assembly from the City of Ottawa. They've been incredibly engaged uh, with the Mayor and Council. This is a file that's uh, that's very important, and they've represented their constituents well. And despite despite the heckling from the other side. I, I thought he actually wanted an answer to his question. I'm trying, Speaker, to give it to him. Uh, you know, again, Speaker, um, throughout this whole challenging time over the last two years, our members have, have stood up time and time again uh, for their local mayors and their local councils. And I think rather than uh, maligning the government, uh, he should be celebrating the fact that there are people in Ottawa, like our MPPs, that are standing up for their interests. Yeah, 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 yeah. 
That concludes our question period for this morning. The member